Okay, so um, as usual, uh, before we start with the contents of today's lecture, just a brief recap of the main points from uh, the previous one. So during uh, the last lecture on Tuesday, uh, we've looked at um, uh, the major characteristics of molten metal that can have an influence in terms of uh, the fluidity. And we said that the capability of a molten metal to fill the mold cavities is uh, defined as uh, fluidity, which consists at, uh, of two basic factors. One, the characteristics of the molten metal, so the, the material that you're using to create your cassette parts, but also, and uh, very importantly, on the process parameters that you are defining for your casting process. And we said that the viscosity is one of those um, uh, things that you need to, to have in mind that can affect the fluidity and therefore the filling in of the mold. And we've said that as the viscosity uh, increases um, and also the, the, the sensitivity of the viscosity to the temperature that we define as viscosity index increase, the fluidity will uh, decrease and therefore more difficult it will be for you to fill in the mold cavity. Surface tension is also another important uh, parameter or characteristic of your uh, molten metal. And we said that uh, normally a high surface tension of the liquid metal uh, has the capability of reducing the fluidity of your material. And this can happen uh, because um, of oxide films that are formed on the surface of the molten metal. Uh, and these have a significant adverse effect on uh, fluidity. And for example, um, the formation of oxide films of, um, on the surface of a pure molten uh, aluminium, uh, it triples the surface tension and therefore substantially decreases uh, the fluidity of your material. Also, the inclusion of uh, particles, uh, insoluble particles, uh, that can have uh, an adverse effect in terms of the fluidity. This effect can be, uh, for example, verified, as we've said in the previous lecture, by observing the viscosity of a liquid, uh, such as oil, uh, with and without the addition of sand particles. So if you have oil and if you add sand particles to it, you will see that the viscosity will increase and therefore the fluidity or the ability of, uh, that you have to actually make the material flow will uh, decrease. The solidification pattern, so the manner in which the solidification uh, can take place, uh, affects um, the fluidity of your material. And as uh, in addition to that, the fluidity is inversely uh, proportional to the freezing range or to the solidification range. And this means that the shorter is the range, <clears throat> as for example, in pure metals, the higher is the fluidity. And for example, in the case of alloys, the long is the freezing range or the longer or, or the, the higher is the difference between the solidus and the liquidus temperature, uh, the lower will be the fluidity of your material and the more difficult it will be for you to fill in the mold cavity. We've also mentioned that the degree of superheats can have an effect on, um, on the fluidity by delaying um, the solidification process. And we've said that degree of superheat is defined as the amount of temperature, the additional temperature that you provide to a material above its melting temperature. And this, obviously, the higher will be the temperature that you set in your, in your uh, casting process, uh, the higher will be uh, your fluidity because the lower will be the, the, the viscosity of the material. Also, the rate at which you pour the material into the mold has an effect in terms of the fluidity of that metal. And we've said that the slower the rate at which you pour the material into the mold, the lower is the fluidity. And this mainly happens because you allow more time for uh, the exchange of heat and therefore you increase the solidification uh, process. And in a very similar manner, the heat transfer rate. So if you increase the heat transfer rate, obviously you will decrease uh, the fluidity of your material. So these are important things they need to know 
and that affects the fluidity of your metal and ultimately will affect um, the characteristics of the part that you are casting. Another important point from the previous lecture is uh, the Schwarinov's rule. And we've said that we can use this rule to calculate the time that it takes for uh, a material to solidify within the mold and uh, to form a part. Uh, and we've also said that the solidification time depends both on the volume of your part as well as on the surface area. And this basically means that the higher the surface area, the more area you have to exchange heat with the ambient temperature, the higher will be your uh, rates of, ex of heat exchange, and therefore uh, the smaller will be your solidification time. So if you have to use a riser to compensate for the shrinkage of uh, the material that we've uh, mentioned in the previous lecture, uh, it is important that you know not just the function of that riser in terms of shrinkage compensation, but also to know exactly where to place that riser. Also very important is uh, in which conditions that riser needs to be maintained in order to um, fulfill its uh, function. And as you can see here in this figure, this is a sand casting process. The material is poured into um, the, the molds. It flows down uh, the sprue, the runners, fill in the mold, and then the overflow of material will uh, fill in your open riser. And it's an open riser because it's in contact with the atmosphere. In this case, it's a side open riser because it's placed laterally to your path but it could also be a, a, a closed riser. So it could be placed inside your molds and it could be placed also on top of your parts, okay? So it depends if it's a, an open riser, if it's in contact with the atmosphere, which is the most common uh, type of risers used in sand casting, uh, but also the position, if it's a uh, uh, position uh, side on the side of the parts or on top of the parts. And um, as we've seen, it is important to use risers to compensate for uh, the shrinkage of your material during the solidification process. We've also said that the solidification time of the material inside the riser should always be higher compared to the cast parts. And this is important in order to guarantee the compensation of volumetric shrinkage that occurs during the solidification process. If the solidification time of the material in your riser is smaller than the solidification time of your metal parts, then this basically means that you will not have material in a molten state within the riser to compensate for the volumetric shrinkage within the mold as this uh, solidifies. And Normally, it's important that you know the specific volumetric shrinkage of each material so that you can calculate for the volume of your riser to ensure that you have enough material to compensate for that volumetric shrinkage. Okay, so it's important that you know how to use the Schwarzenegger's rule, not just to calculate the solidification time of your parts, but also to calculate the solidification time of your material within the riser to ensure that you'll always have material in a liquid state to fill in uh, the gaps left by the shrinkage of your material during the solidification. We've also discussed several uh, defects that can occur during um, the metal casting. We've mentioned several uh, surface defects, but these surface defects uh, don't have such an important impact in terms of the mechanical properties of your cassette parts as, uh, for example, hot tears or uh, porosity. And in terms of these uh, defects, we've said that hot tears uh, in castings normally occur because the casting is not able to shrink freely during the cooling process or the solidification process uh, due to some constraints in various portions of the molds and the cores. 
and that porosity caused by gases evolved during the solidification can also be a significant problem and in particular because uh, of the adverse effect it has on the mechanical properties of the casting. So our goal is always to cast a pot that is 100% solid, no, um, no porosity at all, because that will be detrimental in terms of the mechanical properties. And also we want to have a proper design in terms of our casted part and our mold to ensure that our material as it shrinks, as, as it solidifies, it can do that uh, freely in order not to uh, create or tears or cracks that will lead um, to um, the parts uh, not being properly uh, casted. In terms of the differences between these two important defects, uh, the main difference is actually related with the solidification stage at which they occur. So porosity can normally develop when the material is solidified and all tears normally occur before that, uh, during the solid to liquid stage. Okay, so when you have the material in a mushy state still within uh, the mold, okay, as it solidifies. And these are the main differences between these uh, two important effects in metal casting. And these are just some of the key points of the last lecture that you need to know um, in terms of the, the material that is being delivered in this, uh, in this unit and that is also going to be uh, assessed. So today we're gonna to be looking at the classification of the different casting uh, processes. And this normally is done depending on the type of molds that we use. Also, uh, we're going to be looking a bit more in detail in terms of the characteristics of each process, what are their specific advantage, limitations and applications. And we're going to focus on uh, three main processes, sand casting, investment and die casting. Uh, we're going to be looking at the different stages or steps in terms of uh, sand casting and um, Towards the end, we're going to be looking also how can we incorporate 3D printing with these more conventional manufacturing technologies to improve um, our manufacturing process in general and to obtain parts uh, with more accuracy, more resolution, but also more complex geometries that would be otherwise almost impossible to obtain using uh, metal casting. So in terms of the classification, the metal casting process can be uh, classified into three main categories. Expandable molds and permanent uh, pattern, expandable molds and expandable pattern, and permanent molds. When we say expandable molds or expandable pattern, it means that we only use it once. So we only use uh, the mold or the pattern to create one part. After that, we get rid of it and we need to create a new mold to generate a new mold or to generate a new part. And this is the meaning of expandable. And set casting fits within this category uh, of expandable mold and permanent pattern, which means that in sand casting, as uh, you've seen uh, before, the mold that is normally made of sand is used only once to cast one metal part but the, the, the pattern that we use to give shape to our parts, that can be reused and uh, employed in the fabrication of multiple parts. In the case of expandable molds and expandable pattern, we only use both the molds and the pattern once. And that's the case of investment casting that we'll see a bit more in detail in the next lecture. But we can also have permanent molds like die casting. These are normally uh, metallic molds. They are normally manufactured using CNC machining. They have several advantages, but also they can be much more uh, costly. So talking about um, the advantages and limitations, uh, these are just some general um, advantages of these three different processes. Sand casting, as you've seen uh, from the very beginning, um, 
this is a very manual uh, process. Um, but one of the advantages is that it allows you to use almost any uh, metal. As long as you're able to melt it and solidify it, you're not constrained in terms of the types of metals that you can use to manufacture parts. Also, it has uh, virtually no limits in terms of the size of the parts that you can uh, manufacture. The shapes uh, can also be quite uh, different as well. And this can be further uh, increased in terms of complexity by the introduction of patterns that uh, are manufactured using, for example, 3D printing. Uh, and the cost of the tools, in this case, the molds, the patterns, the cores, it's also quite low when compared to, for example, die casting, okay? And this is mainly because of the materials that I use uh, that can be, for example, wood, plastic, um, and these have uh, very uh, low costs. Obviously, because of the type of the material that we use to create the molds, the sands, they have a, a poor surface finish that normally requires a post-processing stage. Um, and the tolerances can also be quite wide, okay? So in terms of the accuracy and the resolution of the parts, uh, this is normally quite limited when compared to uh, the other processes. Investment casting uh, allows you to obtain quite um, complex geometries. Um, it has a very good surface finish when compared to uh, sand casting. And again, it allows you to uh, cast a wide range of metals. So that's also another advantage in terms of the materials that can be used. The part size is somehow limited. Uh, so you can, you can only build, um, or you can only build much smaller parts when compared to sand casting. The patterns uh, and the molds can be expensive and uh, it requires quite an extensive uh, labor to create these parts and these molds but we'll talk a bit more about, uh, in detail about this in the next lecture. Die casting is probably one of the most advanced casting processes. Uh, it's almost fully automated. It allows to obtain uh, excellent dimensional accuracy and surface finish because of the permanent molds that are normally metallic molds that are used. And because it's also fully automated, it allows for high production rates. In the downside, you have the high cost of the molds that need to be uh, machines. You have limited part size because of the forces that are required um, to close uh, the molds together. And it's normally limited in terms of the materials that uh, you use for the casting uh, process. Okay, so in terms of expandable uh, molds, we have um, two types of casting processes that fall under this classification, sand casting and uh, investment casting. Expandable molds are typically, in, especially in the case of sand casting, made of sand, uh, can also be made of plaster or uh, ceramics. And uh, similar materials are uh, generally mixed with various uh, uh, binders. Um, so you can have the sands, and then we use binders to uh, join these particles together and to improve the mechanical properties of our mold. In, um, in general, a typical sand mold consists of about 90% sand, 7% clay, and 3% uh, of water. The mold is produced from a pattern, and depending on the use of the pattern, the process can have these two classifications, expandable molds and um, permanent pattern, like the case of sand casting, where the mold is only used once, but the pattern, so the one that gives shape to our parts can, use, can be used several times. But in the case of investment casting, both the mold and the pattern are only used uh, once, okay? After that, you need to manufacture a new mold and a new pattern. This is obviously not the case in permanent molds. So these are typically made of metals that maintain their strength at very high temperatures. They can be used repeatedly and are designed in a way 
that the casting can be removed easily from uh, the mold. Normally, this is done by placing ejector pins so that open once you open the molds, the pins will uh, force the ejection of the parts from the mold cavities. The advantage of using these metal molds is that they are much better heat conductors than expandable or non-metallic molds. And this is important as we've seen in the previous lectures because it allows us to control uh, the grain structures that are formed. And by controlling those grain structures, we can refine the size and the shape of the grains and therefore better uh, control the mechanical properties and the surface finish of our uh, parts. In the case of composite molds, they're also quite common and uh, they're normally made of two or more different materials like sands, graphites, metals. Um, and this allows us to combine the advantage of each single material. So these molds normally have a permanent and also an expandable uh, portion. And they can be used in uh, metal casting uh, processes. Uh, and by having these two components, it allows us to not just improve, for example, the mold strength by including, for example, metal uh, parts, but also control the cooling rates and optimize the overall economics of uh, the casting. So if you have a mold made, for example, of sand and metal, the introduction of the metal particles allows you to improve the mold strength because obviously you have a metal component in there, but because also the metal allows you to better control the cooling rates, you can also have a better control over the structures of uh, the grains that are uh, formed. This when compared to a sand mold alone. When we look at these uh, general characteristics of the casting, and this is just an example, you don't need to know uh, this. Um, when you decide or when you have to decide which casting process you're going to use to manufacture your parts, it's important to look at uh, different aspects. Like for example, the surface finish that it's also always something important. And when you look at uh, the surface finish, you can easily see that sand casting uh, has a very low surface finish when compared to, for example, investment casting or die casting. So if you're looking to build a part that requires a very smooth surface finish, certainly sand casting is not the process uh, to choose, and mainly because of the materials that are used to build the mold. If you're looking to build very uh, complex shapes, then the processes that allows you to better uh, achieve that is either sand or investment casting. Die casting normally um, doesn't allow you to, um, to, 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 to do that, uh, mainly because the, the molds are permanent molds and they are manufactured by CNC machining. And as we've seen before, when you have to use subtractive processes to build parts, the complexity of the parts of the geometries that you can achieve, they are normally inferior when compared to additive processes. Also, in terms of dimensional accuracy, if you're looking to build parts that are um, very accurate from a dimensional point of view, then die casting uh, is actually the best, the, the best process. Obviously, there's, that has an impact in terms of the production rates as well. Sand casting is a very manual labor intensive process. So the number of parts they can produce per hour is very, very uh, much inferior when compared to die casting, that it's a fully automated uh, process. So these are important comparisons that you need to make when uh, you want to produce a batch of parts. And if you want to produce something that it's uh, simple from a geometrical point of view, that you don't require a lot of uh, accuracy or resolution, and you don't need to manufacture uh, a very high number of parts and sand casting might be an adequate process. But if you're looking to build thousands of parts, 
with very high resolution and accuracy. Although the initial investment in terms of the tools is higher when compared to sand or investment, then certainly uh, die casting is the process to go. So the choice of the process, it always depends on the geometry of the parts, on the number of parts, and obviously on the cost of your parts. So in this, uh, in this slide, I just wanted to illustrate the different steps involved in uh, the preparation of the manufacturing of parts using sand casting. And all starts with the placing of the pattern. So the part that will give shape to your uh, metal casting parts. This is placed inside the uh, mold uh, to generate an imprint. After that, we need to incorporate the gating uh, system. So the runners, um, the, the sprues, so all the channels that will allow us to fill in uh, the mold. These are all placed inside the sand mold. After you create your imprints, we can remove uh, the pattern and fill in the mold cavity with uh, the molten metal. In the case of sand casting, and this is different, uh, for example, when compared to die casting, the metal uh, needs to be melted uh, separately. So uh, it, we need to melt the material using a furnace and then transport the material and pour it inside the mold. Once placed inside the mold, the mold is closed. So you put a drag and the cope, you close it, and then you allow the material to uh, solidify until it reaches uh, the room temperature. Once it reaches the room temperature, you can uh, open the mold, remove the sands, and then the next part will be to uh, remove all uh, the risers, all the gating systems, and this is normally uh, done using cutting tools. After that, you might need to promote some heat treatment uh, to your uh, parts, depending on uh, the function of that parts. There is a, cleanish, a cleaning and finishing stage. And finally, you need to inspect for, not just for surface defects, but also for internal defects. And if you detect uh, any defects at this stage, you either discard the parts, or if it's, for example, an internal defect like porosity, you can submit the parts <clears throat> to hot isostatic uh, pressures to try to eliminate the defects in your parts. So we've said that um, in terms of metal casting, uh, sand molds can be characterized by the different types of sand that uh, constitute, that are used to build these, uh, these molds. And there are three different types or basic types of sand molds, green sand, cold box, and no bake molds. So in green sand, uh, it's normally a mixture of uh, sand, clay, and water, as we've said before. The, the term green refers to the fact that the sand in the mold is moist or damp uh, while the metal is being poured into it, okay? So green sand uh, mold is the, normally the least expensive uh, and also uh, not just because of the material itself, but also because the sand can be recycled and be used for subsequent uh, casting processes. In the case of uh, cold uh, box molds, we can use different organic and inorganic binders uh, to actually blend it with uh, the sands. Um, and this is normally done uh, to bond the grains uh, in a chemical manner. And this allows it to obtain uh, or to improve the mechanical properties of your mold. So these molds are in general dimensionally uh, more accurate than green sand molds, but also more uh, expensive. The case of no bake molds, they are very, very similar to cold box. The main difference here is that a synthetic liquid uh, resin is mixed with the sand and the mixture is normally hardened at room temperature, okay? Because the bonding 
of the mold in this uh, and in the cold box process takes normally place at uh, at uh, at room temperature so without any heat uh, they are normally called uh, cold setting processes okay so these are the different uh, types of sands that can be used uh, for the creation of uh, sand molds and it is important that you know the differences uh, between them so on top of the different types of sands it's also important that you know the different features in a uh, sand mold and also their function so the flax the flask is normally used to hold or to support the mold okay and the mold is normally uh, consists normally of two parts the drag and the cope and it's normally divided by a parting line between the two of them we also in terms of the running channels we have a pouring basin where we pour the uh, molten metal into the molds this is normally connected to the sprues that as we've seen in the previous lectures are normally tapered to prevent aspiration this uh, is then connected to uh, the runner systems and then to the mold uh, cavity. Very importantly in metal casting, the placement of the risers. The risers can be uh, open risers, so normally in context with atmospheric pressure or blind risers that are normally placed inside the mold. The blind risers are more effective, uh, but in a way they are less used because they are much more difficult to uh, create when compared to open uh, risers. Also, because of the gases that are generated during the, 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 the sand casting process or the metal casting process, it's important to incorporate channels that are in contact with the atmosphere to allow for the extraction of these gases and to prevent the generation of porosity as our molten metal solidifies to the ambient temperature. So it is important that you know the different components of the sand casting mold, but also uh, very importantly, you know their function, especially uh, the risers, and as we'll talk a bit later on, the cores and the patterns. So in terms of uh, patterns, basically the patterns are used to create a negative imprint of your, um, of your part. And they can have different, uh, they can be classified into three different types of patterns. So the one piece pattern that you can see here, also called loose or solid pattern. This is generally used for uh, the creation of very simple geometries and for the production of small number of parts. They are normally made uh, of wood and are very typical in sand casting processes, okay? Because they're also very, uh, they're not very expensive. The other type are the split patterns. So these are two piece patterns made uh, such that each part forms a portion of the cavity for the casting. So you have your parts they are split in two one is placed in the drag the other one is placed in uh, the cup so in the top and bottom uh, parts of your um, of your mold and they will give shape to uh, your parts when the mold is closed um, uh, together so in this way when when compared to the one piece pattern uh, this allows you to build more complex shapes in terms of the parts that you are casting. The other type of patterns is called match plates, and this is very similar to uh, split patterns. They are common uh, type of mounted pattern in which uh, two piece patterns are constructed by securing each half of the pattern uh, to the opposite sides of a single plate. So imagine that you have split patterns and what you're doing is that you are fixing them on a match plate that when brought together, joined together, they will uh, form your parts. So 
these are the typical uh, patterns that can be used in uh, casting, but the geometry and the complexity of the parts that they allow you to create is somehow limited. A way to overcome that is by introducing uh, 3D printing to create these patterns. And as we've said several times, when compared to subtractive processes, 3D printing allows you to build much more complex geometries. So what I would like you uh, now is uh, a video of um, metal casting incorporating 3D printing to create uh, patterns. Sand casting is a simple, cost-effective approach for manufacturing metal parts that are used in many industries, such as industrial equipment, aerospace, automotive, defense, agricultural equipment, and consumer products. To make the sand molds for casting metal parts, foundries use loose patterns, split patterns, and match plates. They also need patterns for gate and runner systems and sand molding tools called core boxes. FDM manufactures these mold-making items. Even before the foundry starts making sand casting molds, it may benefit from using FDM to make models, prototypes, and sales samples of the castings to validate product designs and get customer approval to proceed with the order. With that approval, the sand casting process begins, and it starts with a pattern production. Traditionally, skilled pattern makers in woodworking or metal shops created sand casting patterns. As the availability of pattern shops has declined, Innovative and efficient options such as FDM have filled the void. Complex patterns that once took several weeks to make are now produced in-house in only a few hours on an FDM system. Gates and runners feed molten metal to the part cavities in a sand casting mold, but getting the mold to fill properly often means adjustments. Making an interchangeable FDM gate and runner system gives the foundry the means to do test pours, redesign the gates and runners, and quickly rebuild them. From prototypes to production orders, FDM is an ideal tool for making castings for low-volume aerospace parts or mass-produced hardware for doors and windows. Once the FDM patterns, gates, and runners are made, the balance of the sand casting process is unchanged. First, the FDM patterns are sanded. Next, an optional foundry coat is applied. This seals the pattern and improves abrasion resistance. Now, the pattern is bolted to the match plate flank, and the gates and runners are attached. Then, a mold release is applied. With FDM's real thermoplastics, the patterns are robust enough to withstand the sand abrasion and the compaction pressures when forming the sand molds for any of the methods. Loose pattern sand casting with hand ramming forces for no-bake sand casting, and match plate inserts for green sand casting. Once the sand has been formed around the pattern to create a cope and drag, the sand molds are ready for metal casting. Molten metal is poured into the sand mold. After cooling, the sand is removed with vibratory machines or through hand processes. Sand blasting may be used to remove any residual sand trapped in the cast metal surface. The raw metal castings then go through secondary processes, including gate and runner removal, drilling, sanding, and machining. These secondary processes can also benefit from FDM. Guides for core setting and complex assemblies, drill bushing fixtures for faster machining, jigs and fixtures for straightening and inspecting finished part dimensions. From pattern to finished metal casting, FDM makes the process fast, accurate, and reliable. So as you can see, it's not just the fact that it allows you uh, to build more complex shapes, it also the fact that you can also validate the entire process before you actually run it. So you can design, and as we've seen before, uh, this is uh, critical. You can design the runners, uh, all the gating system, and you can simulate using computational tools, you can simulate the flow of your material and the filling in of your mold's uh, cavity uh, before you actually do it. And this allows you to make any change that you need to do in terms of your channels to ensure the proper filling of your uh, molds. And this is a, an important aspect that 
uh, without uh, 3D printing, without these computational tools, would make the process much more trial and error. In terms um, of the patents, so they actually benefit from the integration of 3D printing, uh, but it's not just the manufacturing of patents that it's important when you want to build parts with metal casting. Uh, the cores also play an important role, especially if you have hollow uh, parts within uh, the part that you actually uh, manufacture. Like for example, the ones that you find in uh, automotive engine blocks uh, or uh, valve bodies. So uh, for castings where you have to have internal cavities or passages, uh, we need to create cores. The cores are placed in the mold cavity uh, to form the interior surfaces of the casting and are normally removed from the finished part during the shake, um, during the shake out process or the opening of uh, the mold. So in general, you first place your patterns um, inside your sand casting molds. You create the negative or the imprints of your parts. You then remove your patterns. And if you have internal cavities, you then place your cores and then you close your mold. And the core is kept inside the mold during the casting process, during the entire solidification of your material until it reaches the room temperature. And it's only removed from inside the mold when you open the mold and you retrieve your uh, parts. In order to keep the core in the right position inside the mold during uh, the metal casting process, we use these um, core prints, okay? And these are basically used to maintain the core fixed in place during uh, the metal casting, to ensure that you have the cavities that you need in the right uh, position. And these are then removed uh, after the part is uh, solidified. So very briefly and a bit more in detail, the different steps of the sand casting process. It all starts with the mechanical drawing of your parts. We normally place our patterns in the cope and the drag, so the bottom and top half of your molds. If we have any uh, internal cavities, after we remove our patterns, we place our cores, we fill in the molds with the sand, the two halves of the molds are joined together, and then the material is poured in a molten state uh, into the molds, allowed to solidify, and once completely solidified, we can remove our cope, and then uh, basically um, cut all the running uh, channels and uh, if needed, do any post treatments like surface finishing to our uh, final parts. So just to summarize, the casting process can be classified into three different categories, expandable molds and expandable uh, patterns. In this case, we only use the mold and the pattern once. The case of sand casting, the mold is expandable, but the pattern is permanent, which means that we can use it several times. And then we have uh, also permanent molds, typically made of metals, which allows us to obtain parts with uh, very high accuracy, but also allows us to have a much better control over the solidification process and as a consequence over the mechanical properties of our parts by allowing us to refine the grain size and uh, shape. Uh, in terms of the sand casting process, we've also said that we can use three different types of sands, the green sand, which is the most typical one, uh, or the uh, cold box and no bake molds. These are normally uh, conducted at room temperature. And in the case of no bake, we use a resin to actually bind the sand particles together, which allows us to improve the mechanical properties of our molds. And as a consequence, 
the resolution and the accuracy of our parts. You also uh, need to know, and this is important, the major features in sand casting, uh, particularly the, uh, the, the fact that the, 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 the sprues, uh, the runners, and the gates make part of this channeling system, but the risers play a very important function in terms of metal casting by providing us with additional material to compensate for the volumetric shrinkage that normally happens during the solidification process. Cores are used to create uh, hollow uh, parts or passages. They are placed inside sand casting molds after the patterns are removed and kept during the entire uh, casting process. Vents are also quite important, especially to remove any gases that are formed during the melting and the casting of your uh, metal and to avoid also uh, porosity. Different types of patterns can be used. They have different functions, also different costs associated. But if we want to increase the complexity of the parts, then the introduction of 3D printing to create not just our patterns, but also our running system can be quite advantageous in terms of the metal casting uh, process. So these are the important things that you need to know. And I'm now happy to answer any questions that uh, you have.